Welcome to worship with St. David's Lutheran Church. Today is Palm Sunday. Let us pray. Sovereign God, you have established your rule in the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those who with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives praise him as Savior who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the triune God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways, assure us again of your love, and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you 
and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Today's scripture reading, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. The Gospel for today is from Luke, the 19th chapter. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners said, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. In the New Revised Standard Version of the Gospel of Luke that I just read from, this section is titled, Jesus' Triumphal Entry into Jerusalem. Triumphal! What an authoritative Bible word. Harumph! Triumphal. Triumph! The Messiah triumphally entering into Jerusalem in triumph. Jesus was acting out a story. You probably know this. He was performing. You've probably had this preached at you before. It's this imagery from the prophet Zechariah about the future glory that's coming for the people of Israel. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The river is the Euphrates River, the source of creation, and the ends of the earth are, well, the ends of the earth. The first thing that will happen is that the king of peace will come humble on a donkey. He will command peace, and his peace will extend over the entirety of the world. But also something else is going to happen. A little later in Zechariah, it says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. 
On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that half of the mount shall withdraw northwards and the other half southwards. And you shall flee by the valley of the Lord's mountain, for the valley between the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him, and the Lord will become king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one, and his name one. So Jesus comes riding down into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. And the disciples are yelling and shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's coming past and then down from the Mount of Olives. The king will establish peace. Peace, shout the disciples. But the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations as on a day of battle. Just like so many in Jerusalem are expecting some divine sign that will tell them to rise up and fight against the Roman oppressor. All of this imagery from the prophet Zechariah, all of these motifs of what it will be like when the day of the Lord arrives. When the king of peace shows up on a donkey and the Lord of hosts appears with his hosts on the Mount of Olives to inaugurate war against the nations. And the dominion of this king, the dominion of the Lord, will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth and over all the earth triumph. God will triumph. God's chosen king, chosen one, will triumph. God wins. Do you ever feel a little silly waving these palm branches? It's imagery from this Bible story, this Jesus story, and we're acting it out, kind of, calling it to mind on this day when we remember the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Imagine for a second what it actually looked like probably. On Wednesday night at the midweek service, I said, what if Jesus was four foot ten? What if that's why so many people, even John the Baptist who baptized him, seemed to be uncertain at certain points that he really was the Messiah? So imagine with me, I can't prove that he was, but you can't prove that he wasn't either. Imagine four foot ten Jesus, tiny little Jesus sitting on a donkey, poking along. Maybe the donkey's stopping to eat some grass. Maybe it wants to go see what's over this way. Maybe it uh, stops and sits down for a minute. Donkeys are known to do that. People are spreading cloaks and waving branches, sure. But what they're acting out is a prophetic vision of a king, a great warrior, so great that he can end all war. Okay, sure, it says he's riding on a, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's probably just metaphorical, right? He's a warrior. He's trying to act humble, but he's a king. He's probably tall and proud. He should be riding on a huge war horse at the head of an army. And then there's tiny little Jesus, the reality. Can't prove that he wasn't. Itinerant preacher from the uncouth region of Galilee, slumping down the hill, from the Mount of Olives on a bulky little donkey, while his uncouth Galilean friends yell, The King! The King! And this is supposed to be the King? This is the announcement of God's triumph? Jesus sells it, I gotta say. He says, If you silenced my people, the very stones would cry out. That's how much this is true. That's how much God is triumphing right now. And then the next thing he says in the gospel is, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why did you not recognize that God has come to visit you? And then he goes into the temple, the center of all worship in Jerusalem, the most sensitive place, and starts a riot. And the Romans arrest him for that specifically. And you know the rest. Triumph. God. Triumphant? It did not look like that. 
It looked like a moderately famous country revival preacher who got too big for his britches, decided to cosplay as God's chosen king from out of the prophets, started a fight in church, a ruckus, and was executed for it. Rome, triumphant. Order, triumphant. The powers that be, triumphant. The way we've always done it, triumphant. What do we look like here in church, as church, shaking our silly little palm branches? Well, we look older than we used to, maybe. Got to admit, I sure do. We look kind of goofy with these things. We don't really look like people who get funky and weird and let loose <laughs> all that often. Maybe a couple of us look like that. <laughs> there are a number of us that gather here, sure. Are there as many as there used to be? Maybe. Maybe not. The church triumphal, triumphant here, now, in this time and place, in our reality? Did you ever encounter that silly thing where when someone dies, we say, they've joined the church triumphant? When some pastor used to say that, they meant the church as it's meant to be, as it's going to be, when we win over the whole of existence, eternity. The heavenly church, the ultimately church, the church that wins. How do we look compared to that idea, all the saints? It's probably not a lot different than little Jesus on his little colt, making his little ruckus as compared to the giant triumphal peace through conquest parade with the mighty peace warrior at its head and God triumphant bestriding the Mount of Olives behind it, ready to let loose the host. What does God's triumph look like? Does it look like glorious victory, obvious majesty, a show of divine force? What do we think, silly little palm-waving church? You're allowed to think whatever you want. Want to hear what I think? I think God's running an insurgency. The Romans at some point marched into the middle of Jerusalem and declared, we've triumphed and you've lost. If you disagree, we'll kill you. Mission accomplished. And we know other imperial armies that have marched into other places within living memory and all the way down to yesterday and declared, this is it. We've triumphed. You lost. None of them won. In the end, none of those invasions worked out for them. None of the declarations of triumph meant anything. Do we think God doesn't know that? Despite all that we've seen, despite all the human beings in the world they live in have endured, despite all the evidence that we have that the empire cannot overcome the human heart. Do we really persist in thinking that God plans to conquer, to overcome, to triumph by force in some way? Just because we keep making that mistake, our leaders and our yellers and our propagandists keep insisting that we can get our way, inaugurate our rule, set all things to our version of right by force, just because we're that adult, does that mean that God is? Of course not. God isn't a big version of us. God doesn't insist like we do, or push like we do, or force like we do. God, I believe, is running an insurgency. God, I believe, is overthrowing hearts, overflowing hearts. God, I believe, is playing a very, very long game. God, I believe, so loved loves the world. God worked 
and is still working through short people and silly songs, prophetic demonstrations, and those who lay down their lives for others. Courageous empathy and vulnerable generosity. The moments when people choose to care and the ways that they choose to welcome and all the times that they push through their anger and fear and self-regard to instead live in love. God isn't coming to kill all the enemy. God is running a stealth operation to destroy all enmity, all hatred, all fear, all the dividing walls that stand between people, between us even. This is the way I understand it. This is one of the ways that you can understand the cross as a triumph. After Jesus dies in the Gospel of Luke, the Roman centurion standing there goes, I'll paraphrase, Oh! The insurgency got him right there and then. Praise God. And of course, the other way that you can choose to understand it is to say, Ah, no, 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 no. This is just the pause. God, God is actually coming back in force with the host to destroy all the enemies. That is triumph. It just hasn't happened yet, but don't you worry. It is coming any second now. And that's fine. I think the Bible story makes it clear that that's a little silly to expect the God that toppled empires through the forces of love and faith and community and the human heart to turn around and act like the empire. But don't stop believing if you don't want to, church. I choose to believe in the insurgency of love and choose to believe that we are all of us called to participate in it, to allow our own minds to be transformed and our own hearts to be overthrown and our own lives to overflow with the love and the faithfulness and the servant spirit of Jesus. Maybe I'm the one being silly to believe that. Maybe I've got it all wrong and maybe mighty King Jesus on his giant war horse will show up to teach me someday. But whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, or whether we all have got it wrong somehow, I believe that tiny little Jesus coming down from Galilee on his pokey little donkey would stop and look at us and smile at our silly palm branches and tell us that we're silly and we're loved and that we can come with him if we want to. I hope I can summon up the courage and the love to follow wherever that little donkey decides to go. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
are God's people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church called to follow Jesus in a wave of the cross. Make us unflinching servants of the gospel. Deliver us from hardship as we comfort the forces of injustice and practice radical compassion. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For the earth and all its inhabitants, created in love, train us to recognize your divine goodness in the world around us. Rouse in us a reverence for creation, that we take care of its resources. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For those in positions of authority, call to lead with integrity and compassion. Supply them with courage and vulnerability when challenged with new ideas. Deliver them from the fear that limits imagination and impedes justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For those who suffer waiting expectantly for mercy and consolation, accompanying those who feel abandoned or betrayed, defend those who are wrongly accused, and embrace those who are incarcerated or detained. Heal those who are ill. Merciful God, receive our prayer. For Christians around the world preparing this week to journey with Jesus to the cross, reveal to us once again the earth-shaking power of humble service, unmerited forgiveness, and sacrificial love. Lead us all from death to life. Merciful God, receive our prayers. We remember those who died, especially Miguel Aguero Cola, those who were commended into your hands. Remember us when you come into your kingdom and prepare a place for each of us with your own paradise. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen.
Gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our well, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.